If you're always trying to be normal, you'll never know how amazing you can be. Maya Angelou, Fulbrighter, 1984. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. It is me, Jalen, and if you're new here and liking the vibe, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. What are you, what are you waiting on? <laughs> Anyway, let's just get right into the video because it's gonna be a long one. So some of you may not know, but I am obsessed with professional development and it's taken a lot out of me not to ooze my professional life into my fun YouTube life. So I'm starting a new series on my channel. It's called Sweet Success and we're gonna talk about getting to the bag and just developing yourself professionally. <laughs> I heard you were interested in applying for a Fulbright. Well, congratulations on taking the first step and thinking about it. And this video is for you. We're gonna give you the rundown on what Fulbright actually entails, the application requirements, how to select your country, how to get an affiliate, all the basics. And then you're gonna get to hear from current and past Fulbrighters about their experience abroad and then application tips and tricks. I hope that this video helps you as much as I wish it would have helped me when I was applying during my process. The Fulbright U.S. Student Program is the largest exchange program offered by the United States government. It allows for young professionals to partake in research, teach English abroad, or obtain a degree or just study a topic in general. It is also dependent upon you and your needs on which one you would apply to. There are other Fulbright grants available like combination awards and other special interest awards like the National Geographic Award. However, I won't be discussing those in this video. I will leave a link to the Fulbright website below so you can familiarize yourself with these grants and what will work best for you. So you can only apply to one Fulbright a year. Fulbright offers grants in over 150 countries, so selecting which country to submit your application to can be a tedious process. Some people select this country on innate interest, so personal heritage and lineage to that country, a research topic that is geared towards that country and only that country, and then the odds of your grant getting greenlit for that country. On the Fulbright website, there is a statistics page where you can see who applied to what grants, how many grants are available. Other Fulbrighters and I I will be discussing how we selected our country later on in this video so please stay tuned if you're interested in understanding like how we selected our particular countries so on the fulbright website there is an application checklist i'm just going to run over the basics each grant might request something different so it's important that you read the instructions very carefully Okay, so the basic rundowns of a Fulbright application are biological data, which just means your birth date and things of that nature, program information, which is just short answer questions that are directly on the Fulbright website. Okay, pause. Sorry guys, I forgot to add the statement of grant purpose. Um, the statement of grant purpose is probably one of the most important things to add into your application. It just discusses the who, what, when, where's, and why's of what you're proposing to Fulbright. We'll get into a little bit more detail in the, in the questioning segment of this video, so stay tuned. Sorry. An affiliation letter. Not all programs require an affiliation letter, but some research grants do. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how to obtain an affiliate. A personal statement, this is going to tell the Fulbright Commission who you are as a person and why you need to be in this particular country. Foreign language forms, not all countries require foreign language forms, so just be cautious of this. And three letters of recommendation. The recommendation letter should not be a testament to your character. Instead, your recommender should be discussing how well you can execute this project abroad. Transcript. I know a lot of people get freaked out when they hear the word transcript because they're like, oh, my GPA isn't good enough to apply for a Fulbright. I want to destroy that misconception. You do not need to have a high GPA to apply for Fulbright. They just want to make sure that you have your, you have obtained your degree. Advice for obtaining affiliate is cold call and cold email organizations that have interests similar to your own. So then you can make a more cohesive statement of grant purpose. Come in. Hi, my name is Carmen Carroll. I'm 23 years old. I'm from Washington, D.C., and I was a Fulbright ETA for the 2019-2020 cycle year. My grant was located in Ecuador. 
Hi everybody, my name is Allison Gilmore. I am a recent graduate of North Carolina A&T State University and I am here at my home in St. Louis. I'm excited to talk to you about my Fulbright grant for a 2020-2021 community-based combined grant in Austria. This grant allows for me to be an English teaching assistant, work with the nonprofit that I got my affiliation letter with and take courses at a local university. Hey y'all, so I am a 2020-2021 Fulbright research finalist. I will be going to the country of Barbados. Hi, my name is Janika and I was a 2019-2020 English teaching assistant in Indonesia. Specifically, I was in a town called Sangata in East Kalimantan on the island of Borneo. I co-taught a little over 400 10th and 11th graders at a public high school. My name is Brittany Edwards. I am a 2018-2019 Fulbright Taiwan English teaching assistant. Why did I choose Taiwan? To be honest, I initially chose South Africa. The first year that I applied to Fulbright, I applied to South Africa and I was not selected. I didn't even make it as a semi-finalist. It was just canceled from January. So the reason that I think that South Africa didn't work out for me is because I didn't actually have any intrinsic interest in that place. It was like I was trying to pander to what might be good. Where can I correlate things that are happening in South Africa with things that I'm interested in? And I feel like the reason I wasn't selected is because the readers can see that. I actually applied again the following year. This time I chose Taiwan. It just, it made so much more sense for me to select Taiwan the following year. I've been studying Chinese since third grade, technically. And believe it or not, I was actually selected as an alternate originally. And then after, I think maybe a week or so, I received an email that I had been transitioned into the role of a recipient and I feel like this is important because that was a space for me where I was kind of rethinking myself I just was in a space of feeling maybe I'm not actually above average but I'm just like I'm just at the cusp of greater than average but not really above average yet and so I feel like it's really easy to get into a space of thinking of yourself less based on whether or not you were granted a Fulbright. Whatever happens with Fulbright doesn't really define you. What is meant for me will be and it will be in alignment with your greatest good and you know what I'm saying? I selected Indonesia because I volunteer for an international exchange organization called AFS USA and in 2018 I was a flight chaperone for a group of Indonesian exchange students on their return journey to Indonesia. In the few days I had spent with the students I was already inspired by their energy and their stories that before even arriving to Indonesia I wanted to come back and then after traveling for a few days in the country I knew I wanted to return for a longer period of time. Indonesia was the most different country I'd ever visited. It was the farthest east I'd ever gone and it was the first country I'd been in where I did not understand the language so I thought it would be great to return as a Fulbright grantee and I knew that my experiences with my volunteer organization AFS and also as an admissions counselor would be useful in my application. It's no secret that this is isn't my first time applying for the Fulbright. The first time I applied for Fulbright, I applied to Taiwan and I applied to obtain a Master's of Science degree in Global Health from National Taiwan University. I was a semi-finalist my first time. When it came down to it, I was not selected for the grant. After reading some of the Fulbrighters who were selected's personal statement and grant purpose, I definitely can see why they were chosen over me. I didn't have the necessary ties to Taiwan as they did. And it, it, it definitely showed in my paper. However, with that being said, I do wanna say that the school still really, really, really liked my application and gave me a full scholarship to attend their program. And that just goes to show like, even if you do apply for Fulbright and don't get it, other things can come from that. So just apply and take that risk. I ended up choosing Barbados just because of the the strong connection that I do have with that country. So my mentor in undergrad, was is from Barbados. I love her so much. She let me cry in her office all the time. My family takes multiple trips to the Caribbean every year. I am partially Cuban. So yeah, the Caribbean just made way more sense for my situation. I also applied to Barbados because the odds were really good. However, I want to say that although there wasn't a limited amount, I found out that I was the only person who got greenlit this year for Barbados. So I wouldn't solely pick a country based on the odds 
because they're definitely choosing quality over quantity. Eight people did apply to this award and I was the only one who got greenlit this year. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're applying to the Fulbright. So I have two previous abroad experiences, technically three. Um, I went to Australia, which is not Austria because everybody thinks I'm going to Australia and they're like, you're gonna be out there with those bugs and kangaroos. And I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> that's not where I'm going. I went to Australia when I was like 13, summer 2014. I went to Germany as a part of an exchange program. So a German student came and lived with me for three weeks. And then I went to go live with her for three weeks. My experience abroad is the reason why I picked the countries that I picked. While I was abroad, I had a terrible experience of culture shock where I was very miserable that I couldn't understand what anybody is saying. I'm like a talkative person, I'm a communicator. So the fact that I couldn't understand what was going on around me, it really frustrated me to the point where I started tuning people out. People would be talking to me. I just had no idea because I'm like, I don't understand you. I'm not gonna listen anyways. I had to overcome that and I had to move past that, but it, it made me to a point where now, when I applied to my grant, I only wanted to apply to places where I knew I felt comfortable. So now I've been speaking German for eight years. People tell me my German's pretty good, but I'm always like, this decision. <laughs> Beginning of my like sophomore year, I was really interested in international travel, studying abroad. I also was majoring in Spanish. Going to a Spanish speaking country for a semester was like definitely on my college bucket list. But I actually ended up doing three abroad programs during my college career. I lived in Kenya for two summers. I did research about women's rights and I also worked at a rescue home. And then I ended up studying abroad to Ecuador my junior year. And then I did a Fulbright in Ecuador. It's really important to note that if you have the opportunity, it's not a must, but if you have the opportunity to travel, be intentional with where you want to go because Fulbright likes that you are committed to the country that you're going to. So the fact that I stayed and lived in Ecuador for four months and I did some volunteer work, I was really integrating myself into the country, it stood out to them for me to live there for nine months. It was a seamless transition. So not only does it help you in your application, but when you actually live there for nine months to know that this is a familiar place, it puts you at ease and your parents at ease too. So I did study abroad before, like I said. I did have a lot of culture shock. I actually had culture shock when I studied abroad and while I was in Ecuador the second time. So you would think like, oh, you studied abroad, so going there for nine months, like you'll be fine, you've done it before. You have culture shock regardless. Like I, I have culture shock when I, when I went from living in DC to going to rural Pennsylvania to go to school. Like everywhere you go that's not a part of your routine, you're gonna experience culture shock. And it comes in waves. So like when you first get to Fulbright, when you first get to your site you're really really excited it's a new city you want to see everything but by week six to like 12 you are really homesick you see everyone back at home doing what you would normally do you feel like you're missing out at home your family and it fluctuates and it just like it really just continues and by the time that you end you're you feel like you're finally at this place of like i can see myself living here and then it's time to go and so just trust the process um and trust yourself, if you're really at a place where you're like, I can't do this, you can always go home. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you're if you're really like, I just, this is not for me, you can always go home, you're still a Fulbright, at least for my commission. So don't feel like you're trapped in this country forever because you're, you're not. My experience in Taiwan was absolutely phenomenal. It is the most magical place on earth to me. I've chased the sunsets there more than I have anywhere else. Just the terrain is so beautiful and diverse. There are waterfalls and gorges and mountains and like desert formations and it's just it's so unbelievably accessible. I felt like I was living the most luxurious lifestyle, living my best life, but also that wasn't the experience of everyone there. So I actually have a book releasing around the end of August, 2020, and it's about my time in Taiwan, but also about how to travel Taiwan, what Taiwan is like, and I go a lot more in depth about, um, you know, what it was like being black there. There were some times that my black skin literally gave me privilege and I was just treated as if I was some distinguished guest and that was just so jarring living in that type of world, you know, especially coming from America and stepping outside of this cage that you're in in America sometimes and just felt so 
free. You don't realize what it is that you're experiencing if you don't have it juxtaposed to something else. Like you can't fully grasp your identity in America without living in a place that has a completely different perception of you. So that was a big shock for me is experiencing that the identity that had been created for black people in America doesn't really fully exist in Taiwan. Living in a world with so much freedom, which was my culture shock, honestly. Yeah, identity is definitely the area where I felt the biggest culture shock because I felt like parts of me were severed because I didn't have the language to express myself. And so I couldn't use wit in the way that I usually do and or even have these deep and meaningful conversations with people because I just literally could not communicate it. So it just felt like parts of me were missing or blocked off, but in that absence, I also got to discover other parts of me and connect with that. And so the culture shock for me was discovering other parts of myself. My time in Indonesia was a 9 out of 10. I could not have asked for a more energetic or supportive school community or funnier teachers. They were always cracking up and the teacher's room was one of my favorite places to be. I had fun just sitting in my back corner observing everyone even if I couldn't understand their jokes. I had a site mate and we got along really well. We had an incredible group of local friends and we often spoke about just how grateful we were for those local connections. Those connections really were everything. I felt like we were always just in awe of all the unique experiences we were having having at our site. It really was a lot of fun. At the same time, you know, there were some low moments, but I think those low moments were overshadowed by how much I just truly enjoyed being at my site and being around the people I had met. Living in Sangata, our town was an adventure. Living in Borneo was an adventure. Every day brought on something new, even if it was something small, but that's what kept things exciting. And we also lived near a national park where we got to see orangutans in their natural habitat. It was just a 20 minute boat ride away from our site. So to say that I was fortunate for this placement is such an understatement. I didn't want to let go of that experience as quickly or abruptly as I had to, but you bet I can't wait for the time that I get to visit again and see everyone. Take care of yourself while you work on your application. You may have the luxury of not being somebody's SGA president while applying to a Fulbright. <laughs> so, you know, take advantage of that. I'm trying to lead 12,556 students. I'm planning events, I'm in meetings all the time. And at the same time, I'm very um, large in my ministry. I do a lot of ministry work. And at the same time, I'm trying to apply to this very intense application. Take care of yourself, give yourself breaks. Don't be hard on yourself. Treat yourself anytime you finish a draft. Every draft I finish is probably burnt my pockets, um, but I, I don't care. Every time I finish a draft, I went out to eat, you know, and like that was just what I did. Like, okay, I finished this draft Friday at noon. I'm gonna go out with my girls this weekend. I would also say that another tip is to let your passion lead you. Tips and tricks, right? What you're all here for. So I say making a cohesive story that makes sense, surefire way of getting a Fulbright. To place this into context, my field of study is emergency response, whether that be humanitarian crisis or disaster management. As we all know, no country has been able to escape the adverse effects of climate change. However, there are two regions in the world that are most impacted. The most effective area is the Eastern Asian region, so the Taiwan area up in there. And then the second most impacted region is the Caribbean. I already live in Taiwan, so it wouldn't make sense to do a study here because I'm already getting that knowledge to apply to the Caribbean. So I wanted to help the second most impacted area. So that was for one, that made my connection to Barbados even stronger. Two, Barbados has a special program that focuses on gender in disaster management, and that's also a field that I'm extremely interested in. No other country has really done the work that Barbados has done with mainstreaming these approaches. So that just also made my application even stronger because these things are relative to this country. You can't just erase the country's name and it'll fit somewhere else. So I think that's also important. If your essay can be written by somebody else, it is not for you, it is not good. So I think you should go through and highlight every word that you think somebody else could have written and get rid of them, make them all personable to you. Just drive home that story. As far as preparing for the application, you want multiple eyes on your drafts. I was a Fulbright ETA, and so how do you connect being an ETA to being a leader? Did you have teaching experience? before it's not necessary but if you if you could say like you tutored a class or you had experiences leading a group of multiple people that really helps make your application stand out also like I said international travel as well it helps make your application stand out it's not necessary but find ways to make 
yourself competitive for a specific country? What makes you want to match with this grant? Why are you applying for this specific country? Oh, uh, tips for your applications? Try to add some storytelling elements, like what got you to where you are now? Like short little blurbs, like why exactly are you led to do a Fulbright? What what kind of Eureka moment came to you to do a Fulbright? Those type of quirky things in your Fulbright kind of humanize you and make you stand out. Here are my tips for new Fulbright applicants. I have a list, so I'll just go down. Number one is to start early. Inform your fellowships office or the Fulbright contact within your college or university and use their guidance if that's available to you. Even if you're an alum of that institution, you should still reach out as they'll likely be able to help you. Explore the Fulbright US Student Program website and carefully read the country descriptions. Learn more about your host country. On that same website, read the application tips and browse for events like webinars as those are very useful. Take a look at the grant statistics. Don't let them deter you, but also don't use them to choose the one country that you think you have the best chances of getting into. Use the alumni directory to find former grantees to your country and reach out to them. In addition to the Fulbright page, do an internet search for Fulbright application tips presentation because many colleges and other institutions have put informative materials together and they're very useful, so take a look at those. In terms of writing, take inventory of who you are, your interests, what you've done, what skills perspectives you've gained from previous experiences, and what you wish to do in the future. How does a Fulbright grant make sense as the next step, and how is that grant going to move you forward toward your goal? Look up statement examples if you need that inspiration to get started. Write, rewrite, rewrite again, and always seek feedback from the right sources. And ask questions. You do not have to apply for a full write on your own, unless you want to, but certainly reach out for help if you need it. Living abroad in another country is definitely one of those things that is a huge turning point for your life and a turning point in understanding yourself or growing or seeing where are the areas that you still have left to grow. I actually see that in correlation to applying for Fulbright and writing your statement of grant purpose and your personal statement because it allows you to kind of really explore the contents of your heart in a way that we might not really ever have the space to do. And one thing that I like about it too is that it reveals a sides to you that you maybe thought were just average and when you're working with another person with an advisor someone that can really help you bring out those things for you that's really integral to writing a strong application pulling out those stories pulling out and seeing what pieces of your life will blend together to make a beautiful and strong compelling case for why this place is the best for you and why you're the best person to be there i really wish that i could tell you that there was just kind of a one step stop shop pot meal about this but it's really just as diverse as we are that was kind of poetic <laughs> okay um anyways sending you all this love and positivity your way I'm really interested in international exchange and cultural affairs, so I hope to work within that field in the near future. So my end goals and aspirations, honestly, I'm just taking it one step at a time, but after I finish this degree, of course, I'm gonna go conduct research in Barbados, but after that, I think I wanna go get my dual JD PhD. So once that's over, I'm really interested in making a think tank, or I guess intellectual entrepreneurship, if you would say. I'm really interested in safeguarding vulnerable populations and changing the standard for research. I want to find solutions to problems that minority communities have because they're oftentimes overlooked and that's just not good for anybody because the nation's is only as strong as their weakest population I absolutely love working with immigrants and refugees and that is actually one of my end goals is to have a career where I'm working with immigrants and refugees in language acquisition and I see language acquisition from taking the methods that I'll be learning as an English teaching assistant I want to take those things as an ETA and see how I can apply it to some form of program in um, the nonprofit that I'll be working in so yeah I'm very
very excited. Um, so now that I'm I'm done with Fulbright, uh, I am working in a creative agency and also a brand consulting agency. So I work a lot with Instagram and Facebook and a lot of bigger brands. I've done projects with Jansport. So now I do a lot of creative work, creative direction. I'm a content strategist, and my my, my main goal is to use my creativeness to uplift vulnerable communities and um, the black community. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, it's not really like that academic rigor per se of Fulbright, but when you say you are a Fulbrighter, it gives you credibility. So that's nice. Feel free to ask any questions on my Instagram at Carmen J. Carroll and good luck to you. My end goals, aspirations? Oh, I don't know. To be honest with you, like to be fully keep it above 100%, I'm the type of person that's like kind of Taoist a little bit in the sense of just going with the flow and um, following the way, Dal, that means way. And um, not really trying to create or forge my own path because I don't want to swim against a current, but rather swimming along with the current when it arrives. So it's the concept of kind of a, uh, a riptide. It's gonna be so much harder for you, for your life, etc. And so I'm very much swim with the current, what is it that is my purpose, and discovering that day by day rather than trying to perceive my current, perceive my destination, and charting out a map to go there. So I'm taking my days and my path as it comes, and we'll see where I end up. I wanna thank all the Fulbrighters who took time out of their day to film a video. They didn't have to do that, so I'm really grateful for them. All their social media and contact information are, is gonna be linked down below, so please, 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 please subscribe to them. Additional resources will also be attached down below, so just, just check out the description box in this video. It is really, really important that you do that. Yeah, so thank you for commenting, liking, sharing, and subscribing. Until next time, see ya.